said that you should open up these sessions with some kind of joke, but unfortunately, um, if anybody that knows me, they'll know that I'm really rubbish at jokes. So um, we're not going to be doing that, thank goodness, and I'm not going to embarrass myself any further. However, um, Accenture came to my rescue yesterday when um, I came across a report which was on the competitive advantage of the liquid workforce. Hopefully you'll see where I'm going with this. And basically what the, the core message in there was, was using technology as an enabler to transform people and organisations into highly adaptive and agile organisations. And this was further supported by also a recent PricewaterhouseCooper report who said that uh, there were four things that CEOs were really um, passionate about and that were really keeping them awake at night. Um, the first thing is productivity. I think everybody can kind of resonate with that. Secondly, um, the competitive advantage, um, making their organizations much more competitive. Um, also on the attraction and retention of talent, but also ensuring that the organization retains as agile as possible, an agile organization. So you can see how that really comes together. So really what we're talking about is um, listening to our people in order to provide transparency and hyper-personalization. And in fact, there was a really good quote within this Liquid Workforce report. And it said, companies must collaborate to empower anytime, anywhere working using collaborative tools and cloud workflows, which all sounds really good, and I'm sure we're all hearing those messages all over the place. So I'd like to ask the question, you know, what does that actually mean for us? And for the past 13 years, Towards Maturity has been looking at benchmarking organizations for effective implementation of learning innovation. In other words, using technology as an enabler and how people prefer to learn at work. And given the change in the workforce and the workplace and the access to resources, the line between what we do in the workplace and how we learn at, at home is actually diminishing. And learners are demanding that we do things differently. So Towards Maturity and Filtered have collaborated together to bring this consumer learner perspective into a new report um, so that learning and development can learn from both learners inside the organization and also from outside so that we can serve them better. And that's available um, afterwards and it's free of charge. That's available freely on stand H21 or right here on B14. So make sure after this, today's session that you go and get your, your free report. Or you can download it if that's more convenient for you. Oops, excuse me. So, why is this so important? Why are learners choosing to go and find out this learning for themselves? And what I'd like to do is just provide a little bit of context for you around what's happening in the workforce and the workplace to give you some idea about why this is really happening. So there's a Global Futures report, um, 2014, and Gen Y, 75% of the worldwide workforce um, Gen Y will be the workforce, 75% in 2000, uh, 2025. 83% of millennials say that freelancing is expected to make up their career path as they go forward. 79% of HR executives are expecting employees to have simultaneous careers. And 33% of people will be working past the age of 65 and 25% past the age of 70 by 2025. So you can see that the landscape is really changing and that we have a whole change in the workforce and the workplace. And so learners are actually going out and learning these skills for themselves to be able to be more adaptable, to be able to be more competitive. And so there's a lesson here to be learned by learning and development from the demands that learners have themselves as a consumer. So we've got two sources of data here that we're pulling together into this one report for you, into these insights. So first of all, we're looking at what we already do within learning and development, and perhaps even challenging some of our own assumptions about how our learners learn. 
because we need to do things differently. We need to listen to our consumers. We need to listen to our learners in order to be able to create those learning interventions that are going to resonate more quickly with them in order to be able to deliver this agile environment for our businesses. Because at the end of the day, we're here to solve business problems. So unless our learning interventions are addressing those business problems, then really we're just wasting our time. So we need to understand what we need to do and deliver that learning where our learners can take it. Get them to drink the Kool-Aid if you like. So we've taken the Towards Maturity Benchmark Report from 2015 and that's the information, that's the benchmark data from over 600 learning and development professionals around the globe and you can see where those people have come from. And then also we've conducted a piece of research with uh, Filtered where we went out to over 3,000 individual consumer learners and 2,084 of those were actually paying for learning themselves. So actually putting their, their hand in their own back pocket to learn their learning. So it's important how we understand how individuals learn and work and it's essential to support that if we're really going to go forward in the workforce. So we promised you 10 insights from learners that you could learn from as learning and development professionals. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Paolo, who's going to take you through those 10 insights, and then we're going to come back and conclude and give you some help as to how you can help within your own organizations and take that forward. And then there'll be time for questions at the end. Paolo. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Mani, for the brilliant introduction and also for working together over this project over the past few months. It's been a great experience for me personally and for Filter as a business to get involved with Towards Maturity uh, and learn from them about the L&D community in the UK and worldwide. Uh, you'll hear again from Mani in about 15 minutes after my insights, then she will wrap up the sessions with what we can do next with all those insights. Um, when I put my notes together, which are here, I might not need them, but I promise myself not to be too salesly, despite I have a marketing background, but I don't, I'm not here to sell anything today, I'm just uh, representing Filter and Towards Maturity together. Um, However, I, let me allow a minute to mention a couple of things. Um, I, I had a bet, louder. Uh, I had a bet with a colleague in the office that this is going to be the most retweeted and shared presentation today and tomorrow. Uh, but when, we're not presenting tomorrow, so please feel free to take as many pictures and videos as, as, you, as you can. Um, I'll, I'll be able to share the presentation with you afterwards. Uh, my uh, Twitter account is at Paolo Lenotti and the business is at Filter Courses. Obviously the hashtag today is uh, LT16UK. Um, this is our stand, B14. Uh, I'm a big uh, coffee fan. Feel free to come over, offer a flat white today or tomorrow if you want. We can talk more in depth about this point, so our personalized approach to learning or any other topics that interest you about learning. My in particular is how we consume education through technology. I come from a family of teachers, but it was kind of old school if you want face-to-face -face, face -face education. I'm, I grew up in the 80s with video games and technology and all is changing and all is very exciting. I think I'm getting a bit too loud. I don't know. You tell me, guys, at the back. Um, so the research, if you look at this this study from the consumer angle is all very positive and exciting. Um, the learners these days seem to be um, very ambitious and innovative and they're confident, they take risks. So the outlook is, is quite positive. For example, 80% say online learning can help them further their career. Actually, 70% said that that already happened. Uh, so it's not just a sort of desire, it's actually a reality. Over 90% said they they own, they are responsible for their own uh, learning and development in the workplace. However, we know from, what, from the research that uh, um, Mani just mentioned that only 21% of L&D leaders support career aspirations in the workplace. Actually, four out of five fail to engage personally with the staff. 
Okay, so this starts creating a bit of a paradox here between, and we will see a lot of this today, between what we want, to be honest with you as individuals, and what we are offered by our managers. Is this a bit noisy at the back? I feel a bit. Is it okay? Uh, so I thought, what is the love? Uh, come on, we have a lot of passion here, a lot of interest, and uh, this mic is not doing me much favor, but I'll try my best. Uh, I think the learners should go out on a date, maybe be taken to Paris from the managers, it's just a two hours uh, trip from here. 88% um, know what learning they need, 81 know how to find it. However, three in five of our L&D leaders uh, don't believe that we actually as a staff can manage our own learning. So there is a big contrast here. So what is the truth? Where, where, where do we stand, really? Um, technology features heavily in this research. Um, mobile is one of these points I want to touch on today. Two in three find access in learning from a mobile device essential or very useful. Um, but it's more like catch me if you can situation if you want because 40% of L&D leaders agree that staff can actually learn in places that are convenient to them which is obviously for example through a mobile device and half of our learners these days have to learn and to be honest I'm one of those you probably are too uh, have to learn weekends and evenings because sometimes time is a barrier in the office you can you can't actually see the return on investment um, which in a way proves this point that at the moment training is not actually flexible enough, it's not convenient enough for us to consume. Um, there is more to the trainees' life than courses. 80% uh, for example say that Google or other search and web resources are essential or very useful to learn. Uh, but this is just one of, of many stats that prove that uh, there's a lot of other resources that we can use. I recently attended uh, the latest uh, Learning Directors Network event, which some of you might, might have heard of, some of you actually might even attend here. Uh, it's, a, it's a series of quarterly events organized by the Learning and Performance Institute and chaired by Don Taylor. Uh, a few weeks ago we met here in London and one of the key points we discussed, which was actually this data here, was that over 50% of businesses uh, still, at the end of the day, still see the course as the only option. I can see some phones up. This might be doing me a favor too, too wise. That's nice. Um, so the point was like courses, not resources. But to me, and to over 2,000 people here, and to you, I guess, too, courses are resources. They're the same thing. A webinar is a resource these days. A really good blog post on a relevant uh, website is a resource. Uh, this show, and that's why I took this screenshot from Google, this show is a resource as well, if you want, if you know how to make of it, if you plan for it, if you go to the right, uh, the topics that interest you, if you know how to network with people, maybe if you stay out at night, that helps too. Um, so this idea that it's either a course or a resource, I think is really old school. And it's kind of dangerous for us, I think, both as individuals and as businesses. Um, I think then what we can do, this is all nice, but you can say, all right, it's a bit wishy-washy, where are you going? I think we can learn two things here. One, as businesses, uh, especially L&D leaders, I think need to know how to track exactly, so a more analytical approach, uh, track these new tools. Because of course, if you want, especially a face-to-face, -face, it's fairly easy to use. Maybe courses, you, kind of re you can re-offer the same course that you offered last year. It's a tick in the box. Yeah, Paolo went, how was it? Okay, that kind of thing. So they need to be more confident. How do you track? How do you track the success of a webinar from the learning point of view, not from the business point of view that organized the webinar? Um, or how people spend a lot of time maybe uh, reading stuff on, on Twitter. So is how they're learning, okay, but how can we track that? How can we monitor that? So I think L&D leaders need to come probably from, uh, a lot of things have changed no? over the past 10, 20 years technology-wise. They need to really relearn, almost educate themselves how to use these tools. However, that's a bit, I don't think it's never black or white. And I think we also as individuals need to take more responsibilities. For example, if I attend a webinar, uh, then I should find my ways to go back to my manager and say, I attended the webinar last week, I learned A, B, and C, actually D and E, they weren't that great, but I'm presenting my feedback and I'm showing that I'm learning in different ways, because it can't just be a one-way kind of communication. Also, I think both, both sides of it.
you know, we both need to, to, to develop from that point of view. Uh, I'm halfway through. Um, so if you have any questions about this insight so far or any comments, any input, please feel free to contribute if you want. No? It's all clear? Good. So I mentioned technology features heavily in this research. Video is king. We consume a lot of video these days. Um, I previously worked for The Guardian before this job and the video team was like really one of the best teams, the really growing teams in the business because video keep you on the site. Uh, they help your search engine, obviously. So there's a lot of good uh, benef the benefits that don't just help the learners, but they add the website too, if you want. Uh, over 50% of our uh, learners, over 2,000 people, use YouTube for their own learning. And 90 nearly 90% download apps, productivity apps, education apps, all kinds of apps. However, 50% of L&D leaders feel held back by staff reluctance to engage with new technology. And this has come from 600 senior L&D leaders worldwide. So this is, you know, this is obviously a very uh, uh, valid source of information from towards maturity. So I think, how can it be that my manager, one in two in the office, is thinking, Paolo is not that confident with technology, and then I'm probably using YouTube or similar video platforms. YouTube is just one of them, obviously, to learn. Certainly there's something wrong here, there's something we need to do. Um, personalization is obviously a big trend these days. I'm a big Netflix abuser, I would say, probably not user. Um, you probably too, um, Amazon, Google, all the famous kind of successful companies these days, at the end of the day, what they do, they work with data, and they use this big or small data, and they know how to uh, make out the most out of it through clever algorithms. This is what we're trying to do here, by the way, as 10B14 in the education industry. This is possibly the best presents I received this, uh, just a month ago uh, for Christmas. Um, uh, I haven't opened it yet, actually, because it's so special that I might keep it for a few months. Um, and that was a personalized eating experience, I would say. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm Italian. I actually studied Nutella and Ferrero as a case study a few years ago. It's super interesting, so if you want to actually just talk about that, today I'm here. And the, learning, the eating experience and the emotions that the packaging gives you, the milk that represents your mother, it's very, very interesting. Uh, but hey, one in two want a personalized learning experience. One in four consider that essential. So we really need to listen to our learners. If then they go home and listen to and watch Netflix, so we date online. We, you know, we really, the L&D community need to take this seriously. However, only one in five businesses that offer training these days has a sort of technology element to it. And obviously the tech side of things is, is uh, huge, is critical when it comes to just-in-time learning and algorithms and personalized learning. And it's probably not acceptable anymore. Now, this is my line manager. Believe it or not, his name is Leonardo. Uh, or you can call it Jordan, if you want. Uh, he's a very inspiring bloke, a bit over the top at times, uh, but he is inspiring me to, to, to learn, to train. And one in three actually say that training support from the managers is critical. Now, I came out with this slide as a bit of a joke over the weekend, but I actually thought and rethinking about the film that there are, and I'm sure most of you have watched this film, there are some amazing bits about training when he picks up the phone and everyone is around him and he, he is telling them how to sell over the phone, call pure cold calling, or when he writes the, the speech, the history of the company that he came up with, that's training to me. So if you, know, well, if you have to sign a leadership and, and kind of uh, leadership course, maybe just think about this film. Maybe some people might say as a marketing people will definitely appreciate that and understand what you're doing. However, only one in five L&D leaders equip line managers with the tools to support the teams. So this is a bit of a tricky one. This is one of let me help you kind of, you know, that sort of help, you know. When, but basically we have L&D people that are not really feeding information to the line managers. So how can the line manager do a good job with their own team? Just not possible. Uh, a few more points. One is on collaboration. Uh, so we touch on the personalized experience, but working on this research, I noticed that personalized is not 
personal, personalized experience doesn't mean working in isolation. I think um, maybe these days we kind of confuse the two a little bit. You don't need to have a, a customized experience. Um, you don't have to be isolated to have a customized experience. You can collaborate with people. 84% of learners these days are willing to share knowledge uh, through technology. However, only 27 do that at the moment. So why is that? Perhaps because they're not given the right tools, the right opportunities to actually solve problems socially. And that's the data again from towards maturity. I had um, a meeting with a colleague who is here actually today, um, just after January, the first week of January, a month ago. A very busy month ahead, preparing for this work and this talk, and coming back, a bit of January blues, and then lots of uh, good you know, um, ideas and resolutions for the year ahead. Though. One of them was to improve my uh, productivity kind of skills, how to manage my time, how to manage my tasks. Um, not that I do a bad job there, but there's always room for improvement. Um, so in, normally what will happen there is that I would mention it to my manager and he would say, Paolo, why don't you consider um, how, to, you know, how to improve your productivity type of course? It's a few hundred quid, go out of the office for a day. Um, but if you're honest about it, the outcome might be unsure, it might, it might cost me a lot, it's not personalized very likely, and it's, it can be really good, but it might not be great. Uh, so I had a chat with a colleague and he mentioned this app called Wonderlist. I don't know if you have, if you have heard of it, it's a, an app, it's a free app owned by Microsoft and it's a great tool. And now I moved all my tasks from an Excel spreadsheet or my, my, my pen and my notepad into this app which I can use with my phone and it's very simple. I don't usually like these tools much. I've used, for example, Productive and Trello in the past and I found them too complicated. This one is that basic that you can't even change the background image, for example, it's, too, it's that simple. So that kind of thing, you see, that was a resource to go back to the previous point. It wasn't a course. I might still go and take that course this year, but so far, that definitely had an impact on my productivity, which is why we're all here at the end of the day. I've been happier, uh, more satisfied, I'm doing a better job, my boss is happy, I go back to him, and to, to what I just said earlier, in a new, in a new way of uh, showing what I'm learning and the tools that I'm learning. Okay? Uh, so collaboration is essential, but it's also up to us, I think, to take a bit more responsibility too. Finally, high and dry. 57% uh, want learning to contribute towards a qualification and certificate. So this is a big uh, old school kind of point of view, the old, you know, the old fashioned piece of paper if you want, but it's important. How can you blame us when we spend so much time training? However, just 22% of L&D leaders recognize and reward learners. Um, and it's not enough if nearly 60% are after that recognition. The last insight, which I'm going to leave to Mani, is about L&D. So managers are still key, and that's great. L&D uh, input is still key, and that's why we are here, basically. Um, and we know, from what Mani is going to tell us, though, that it's not too bad, the situation. I mean, there are companies that are getting it right. And now, in the last few minutes, we're going to touch on that. So what we can do, we have learned that there is a big clash, basically, in the workforce. What we can do next to improve things. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll be here today if you want. Cheers. Back again. Okay, so as you can see there, um, we've given you um, 10 insights into um, what learners are really looking for that we can learn from to be able to create those learning interventions so that we can deliver better business impact back into our organizations. And I think um, on this final um, point here, L&D input is, is key here. High performing um, L&D teams do understand their learners as consumers. Oops. They do understand their, sorry, they do understand their learners as consumers. And they're actually um, delivering back further impact. Uh, the top learning organizations are consistently understanding what their learners need, where they need it, and they're designing learning interventions in order to meet that need, which is driving agility and also driving twice as many benefits back into their organizations. 
So what I want to share with you now is not just the insights from the learners and, and the, the consumer learner, but also what we can do practically as L&D in order to be able to um, deliver better impact through our learners. So I want to share with you some of the lessons from the top learning organizations. They actively listen to their learners. They give them a customer activated voice. They think beyond the course. So it's not all about coming into the classroom, but it's also about making learning available wherever they are and creating micro content, for example, and looking at different ways of learning. Learning that learners are automatically doing at home as well as wanting to do within the workplace. They're simplifying the learner experience. So they're making it easy for people to go to the content that they're looking to, to, to have access to. They're delivering it at the point of need and they're allowing le learning at any time. So this argument about I don't have time to study, actually I'd like to challenge that in a very big way. Because if you were to look and ask people to do a kind of time and motion study, and to look at the amount of learning that they're doing as a natural course and of, of events of their day and at home and at the point of need, then you would probably find that we challenge the traditional methods of learning or our traditional outlook on learning. So instead of getting, say, five days a year, isn't that great? Look at all those bits of micro learning that we're taking. And if you add it all that up, actually, we do have time to learn. We don't just recognize at the points at which we are learning. So I think actually, as a learning and development profession, we also have a responsibility to educate our learners that they're learning all the time. And this argument of, I don't have time to learn, actually, we can completely negate that. They also support staff in their careers and their wider career aspirational goals. Going forward, if we think back to the workplace and workforce, and we think about this freelance environment, it's no longer um, acceptable to our learners just to give them learning to do their job at that particular time. Learners are looking for more. If we're going to go on and have simultaneous careers, then we want to know that what we learn within our existing workplace is actually going to be valuable elsewhere. And what is it that we're going to gain from our current working environment in order to be able to move on and to progress our career? And as learning and development professionals, we really need to listen to that because otherwise we're not going to attract and retain the talent that we need in order for our businesses to function going forward. They also facilitate the collaboration. So they help people to share and to learn. They create communities of practice they help to seed those social environments. They help to put people together and to make it acceptable for people to learn around the coffee machine or to collaborate in groups around, or they create social learning platforms for people to curate and to share their knowledge. Maybe have learning champions. They also support performance within the workflow. So actually recognizing through manager involvement that learning is taking place all the time and making it available so that we can access it all the time. And they're helping staff to help themselves. So it's not just saying, oh, here it is and go and get it. We've got a great academy. But also top learning organizations are helping their learners and directing them and facilitating that collaboration. They're directing them as to how they can learn and teaching them how to learn and where to go and what learning is, is all about. And they're actively involved in that process. So actually bringing about new skills for L&D, perhaps facilitating collaboration, perhaps being more performance consultants, and actually engaging and putting people together within that learning environment. So if you'd like to know more about this, if you'd like to gain more insights, then please do go either to Stand H21 Towards Maturity or B14 here and pick up your free copy of the Consumer Learner at Work, which will give you some insights. Alternatively, you can download that on the website. But before we go, in the spirit of collaboration and also just leading up to these questions that you may well have, what I'd like to ask you to do and to encourage you to do right now is to take two or three minutes while you're sitting here and while you're reflecting upon some of the messages and some of the insights that you've, that you've learned this morning, this afternoon, and to turn to the person to your left or to your right, behind you or in front of you, and just ask, what are you doing? How do you listen to your learners? How, do you un how much do you understand about your learner environment? And as a consequence of today, 
what would you do differently or what's inspired you to do something differently in order to encapsulate those learner requirements to take that back into your organization. So I invite you to go ahead and just have a chat with your person that's sitting next to you and just have that conversation and learn from each other, collaborate. There's a new insight for you.